Hello and welcome to episode 72. In this week's episode I am talking about Decembery things like summer fruiting raspberries. I'm talking about planting Scylla, vast amounts of Scylla, Scylla siberica and Scylla spring beauty. I'm talking about our new way of storing dahlias and I'm talking about the unexpected rooting capacity of November soil. The garden has, has reached that daydreaming state where it looks completely vacant, but there are still things going on. There is a mind at work below the surface. All in all, it's a very exciting episode, and it includes descriptions of horticultural vigilante justice. Enough teasing, let's get on and listen to The Week in Gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening. Autumn has tipped over into winter here, which means this is the last week in gardening that will focus heavily on the process of raking up leaves. I'm sure that some people will be relieved to hear that. Others will no doubt be disappointed. I think that I can class myself in the disappointed camp. I still had quite a few strong leaf clearing analogies to go through. There's one about the crystal maze another about starlings, about clouds of locusts, lots of potent imagery used to make collecting thin brown little bits of plant more exciting. But I suppose the leaves will all fall off again next year. That's the joy of being a gardener, anything left unsaid, any of those moments of halfway down the street regret when you realise I should have told them what I thought. They come around, they come around next year. It is life on infinite repeat. Here in the garden we are reincarnated every April, like the tax year, given a chance to to repeat our mistakes and to, to have those conversations with flowers and with listeners that we didn't have. So if you have anything that you missed me talking about in, in 2019, then all I can suggest is that you go forward and, and listen to me in, in 2020 as well. I'll, I'll no doubt cover it then. On Monday, I began by blowing up some leaves. Not locusty leaves. These were more like flattened newt leaves. Leaves that had been turned into newts and then steamrolled and left to damply stick together. I was blowing them in the rain from an area of semi woodland, an area that's shaded and planted and has rough grass underneath where it doesn't get killed by, by the lack of light. It gave me quite a useful lesson about the things that happen out of sight, the secret goings-on beneath the soil. It's tempting this time of year to think of the garden as a slightly damp and very muddy outdoor room, with everything still and dead and waiting to, to start again. But actually there are a huge amount of processes going on. Beneath the soil, things are still fairly warm. The soil can't really tell how how frosty it is in the morning. It doesn't know particularly that that this is gloves weather. It knows that we're just trending gently downwards. And there's still enough warmth in the soil for things to be doing things. This was demonstrated to me with the leaf blower. A couple of weeks ago, we, we planted hundreds of little primula plugs in that semi-woodland. Little, little native primulas, about, I don't know, 150 of them. Plug plants are the ones where it looks like like seedlings have been put into a vast, big ice tray. It's an ice tray that wants to produce a cross between classic gin and tonic ice cubes and icicles. So they're slightly extended, slightly longer, but, but with that sort of ice cube style cross section. And most people who buy plug plants are are going to grow them on, maybe put them into a nine centimetre pot and sell them to the public. But primulas, I think, go very well planted in this very cheap, very economical, very easily posted form. So we planted these in early November, got them down into the ground, 
got their little primula leaves up like like tiny cabbages that you might pipe onto a cake with an icing gun what are they called those icing bag with an icing bag and they were all sitting there very happily and then a load of leaves came down whoosh upon their heads and then they sat there under the leaves very happily until i came along with a leaf blower and cleared up all the leaves and cleared up the hundreds of plug plants at the same time so we had this frustrating session of of fiddling through this leaf pile pulling out plug plants and replanting them and there's nothing more galling than planting a plant a second time it's happened to me with with squirrels before not replanting squirrels but replanting bulbs that squirrels have dug up I worked in a garden once which had more intelligent squirrels than this garden. The garden I'm in at the moment, the squirrels haven't quite worked out that tulip bulbs are a delicacy, which is a wonder for me. It's going to be a horrendous Pandora's box moment the time the first squirrel tastes the first tulip bulb. But for the moment, they don't know that these things are, are a joy. And um, so we're safe here. But in that garden, they loved, loved the tulips. They were very, very bright, very well brought up South London squirrels in the Putney area. And they would go as soon as they saw a gardener. They were like robins. They would hover on the edge of his work zone and then go in and hoik up, hoik up these the bulbs. And if they found a daffodil, then they would just curse and move on and leave it lying discarded by the pile like a vegetable thrown away by a teenager. And the gardener, would come back and say goodness probably something like that and they, they you know gardeners speak and put the bulb back into the hole and the squirrel would dig it up again and I did this four or five times with some daffodil bulbs it's a horrible feeling so anyway I had to go back and, and put these little primulas back in their holes they're a little bit more bashed up roots slightly splayed some of them had lost a few leaves no doubt few of them have ended up in the leaf mold bin where they will be crushed beneath strata of, of leaf layers. So all of those were placed back in and then given another two or three weeks, two or three November weeks to grow until I came along once more and once more hoyed off their blanket of leaves. But now their roots had anchored them. They were dug into the ground like fence posts. Those roots had gone out in the warm soil while the leaves did absolutely nothing, while the leaves almost drew into themselves. The roots had gone snaking around. And that's going on everywhere in our garden. The bulbs that we've been putting in recently are starting to send out those, those little fine fragile roots. The herbaceous plants that may look dead and done, well, they're using the energy. They're using the energy they took back from those leaves, from those dying, drying out flower stems and they're putting them out into their roots the world continues sometimes we might want to just shut the patio doors and, and look at it from inside that's fine but it is still growing out there so it was nice to be reminded of that on monday on tuesday i was planting scylla in the rain Scylla is a lovely, cheerful blue bulb. They have quite a lot of it at Kew Gardens. It looks fantastic as a bright blue carpet in early spring. And I want that. I want the watery feel. I want it to look like a child's painting of the sea when they look out of this particular piece of, of grass that I was planting them into. So I chose about 1,500 species Scylla. Scylla siberica this is, and about 1,500 of a slightly larger and more intensely coloured cultivar, which is called Spring Beauty. And I've heard that Spring Beauty is a sterile cultivar, so it won't seed itself around. But I know that it does clump up well and provide big lumps of, of bright blue. So what I'm hoping is that the the species will and that will throw out the the froth and the spray it might be that the cultivar isn't sterile it maybe it doesn't come true to type maybe it reverts to a more more traditionally cellarish planting maybe it's a lie i read it on the internet it's so hard to get good information i need to find a incredibly old and ancient withered bulbs man or bulbs woman someone who looks like an underground tuber of some sort, who can tell me this 
is what happens with this, this is what happens with that. Not some blog put out by a, a temp working for a for a seed company, but never mind. If anyone's got any contacts in the in the withered and wizened old worlds of Scylla spreading, then send them my way. Until then we will see what happens. I got very, very good at planting these Scylla in the end. The ground was soft and perfect. I was using this this hipster hoary hoary knife that I talked about a few episodes ago. And I got it down to about three seconds per bulb, a rate that is not sustainable. It gives you tendinitis and, and horrendous aches in the forearm. But once you set yourself a challenge, how many can I do in, in a minute, in two minutes, in ten minutes? You whiz through them. I found the technique was one firm grip on the handle and then one hand gripping around the blade and then sticking the, the thing into the ground, using the hand around the blade as a pivot pushing the hand around the handle down, lifting up a flap, poking in the bulb with a thumb, and then whacking it down and onto the next one, shuffling around on my knees while I did it, of course. I don't know what my overall planting rate was. If I was doing it at three seconds per bulb for the whole 3,000, it would have taken two and a half hours. It seemed to take me a lot longer, most of the day. So maybe I was working on more like six and a half seconds per, per bulb, plus cups of tea and, and a break to, to have a sandwich. But still, it was a, a pretty good piece of all-round bulb planting. I probably looked like a mad shuffling treasure hunter, desperately stabbing at the ground, thinking I know there's a golden crown in here somewhere. Or like one of those those birds, a jackdaw that's buried a, a stash of something somewhere and is now going to dig up the entire garden looking for it. Hopefully it will be worth it in spring. It's going to be one of these plantings that will look lovely in the first year and then even more lovely in the second year and then suddenly will either take off or give up. And I'm hoping it's the take-off, and in the third, fourth, and fifth year, we will start getting clumps and seedlings, and the thing will be self-sustaining, and my efforts in planting 3,000 will look laughable in the face of fecund Mother Nature, who has spread a million of them across southern England. On Wednesday, I was cleaning up leaves. I won't talk too much about that, you've heard about leaves. I'll tell you what my colleague was doing. My colleague was doing something much more interesting. He was lifting the dahlias, the, the dahlias that have been doing well, but not quite as well as last summer this year. And he has hit upon a new technique for, for this year's dahlia storage, which is storing them in cardboard boxes lined with newspaper and a pretty dry compost. Last year we filled flower pots with pretty dry compost and dahlias and we had a very good success rate. I don't think any of them really rotted away. So this isn't for the, the health of the plants. It's simply because flower pots don't tessellate and cardboard boxes do. And so you get a wonderfully neat storage area because you can pack these cardboard boxes up and then build a wall from them. And each box can have a little message in marker pen like Bishop of Clandath times four written on the side. And it's quite exciting to walk into the, the bulb and plant storage area and see this great big looming wall of, of dahlia. You think of the concentrated flower power that lies dormant within these boxes. It makes them feel a bit like, like special effects stored for, for some film production. Or like fireworks, like, like a big warehouse full of fireworks. And each of them can be taken out of their, their specific drawer and hurled at the ground. And there it will explode into, into exciting flower. I think that's how you'd, you'd view dahlias. If you were one of the beech trees that looks over the garden and you see the world on a different time scale when years flash past in a flicker, then you would see the, the dahlia flowering as a little bit of floral pyrotechnic, a little whoosh, poo, there and then gone, back to bare soil. So that's quite, that's quite exciting. He's done very well. The tubers don't seem to have on a huge amount this year. We haven't got any that are in desperate, desperate need of, of splitting. It just wasn't as sunny a year. Not enough nuclear space energy. Never mind, next year. Next year we will have a better daily a year. On Thursday, I was off in the London Metropolitan 
archives looking at sources for, for the London County Council of Gardens of the late 1880s, I found the most fantastic handwritten report of an inquiry about a rogue superintendent of the park. This is Finsbury Park up in North London, whose superintendent had been appointed in the in the 1860s and had no supervision since. He'd just been forgotten and left to get on running this kingdom. And he sort of behaved a little bit like a little bit like Kurtz in the heart of darkness and created this this kingdom around him. And finally it has been drawn to the attention of, of the board that something should be done. And the chief architect opens this this inquiry and I found the transcript of it. And there are fantastic bits about Cochrane's way of running this park. I'm going to read you a few questions from, from the architects and Cochrane's answers. Question 7. Is it true that you have ever thrashed with a stick whilst other men held them persons who have committed offences against the park's bylaws? To which the, the park keeper responds, I have done so, but only when there has been no evidence on which a magistrate would convict. But I thought them guilty and I would have had them punished. And what were their offences? Indecency. How many cases of this manner have you dealt with? About seven. Did you once tar the private parts of one such man? Yes, an organ grinder, an old man. They were tarring the paths at the time. Did one of the men whom you had just thrashed once get kicked or pushed over a hurdle onto a heap of stones and get his upper lip cut through and his nose cut till it held on by a thread and the sight of one eye destroyed. He did. Did an old lady subsequently see this man lying covered with blood under one of the park seats? Yes, but I don't know her name. So I thought that was a fantastic example of the way that the park keepers had gone slightly rogue within their domains. The inquiry goes on to, to list this band of gardeners that Cochrane has, has recruited and who do no gardening but just hang around in the rockery like vigilantes. There are other wonderful bits, like questions 23 and 24. Question 23 is, do you keep a cow in Finsbury Park? Yes. When did you discontinue it? I keep it there now. This is at a time where there was a slight scandal because people thought that the, the superintendents of London Parks were growing vegetables in the kitchen gardens for their own table using, using employees' time. And while we're here, we have, we have Finsbury Park with its cow and its vigilante greenkeeper. Anyway, these are the wonders that can be found lurking around in the archives. It must be noted that even with these vigilante actions, Finsbury Park was a hotbed of indecency in this period, recording more incidents of, of indecency than all of the other London parks combined. And part of this inquiry asks whether that might be because the park keeper refused to put up any notices, warning of the behaviour or the consequences of it, because he preferred to catch the people in the act I think this is probably the period where, where park keepers developed the ferocious reputation that they would have in, in Edwardian literature as the nemesis of the unruly scamp. All of the workmen in this inquiry, when they were interviewed, talk about the governor and seem to contradict themselves. And when asked, when asked, is there a horse in the park? I don't think so. Maybe. Well, the, maybe the governor has one. Is the governor allowed? I don't know. Anyway, Thursday ended and I was back into the garden for Friday. And on Friday we finally moved the, the big potted citrus trees. They were in line to be one of those unexpected defoliated plants that I was talking about earlier. These are ones that we had growing in beds within the greenhouse and they had turned themselves into these horrible mildewy heaps of green. They were having a miserable time in there away from the, the open air in that humid conditions, particularly in the summers. They'd sort of become overly coddled in a way. They'd got the plant equivalent of bed sores, 
horrible infected things caused by inaction and changeless adherence to an unpleasant climactic condition. They had got covered in sooty mould, which was coming from various attacks of insects, from aphids, and particularly from, from woolly aphids. So they spent the summer outside, and it's toughened them up remarkably. It's like some extreme boot camp for fat delinquents. They've come away from the summer tight and taut. Their bark seems to fit them better. The, the flaps of damage with their, their insect residence seem to have closed and healed and scabbed over. They are like new plants, and I have been immensely happy for them all summer. But over the last few weeks of brinksmanship, the, the gardeners play with, with all their plants, I've been slightly worried, slightly worried about the night frosts, and I've been coming in and seeing the leaves coated in, in ice, and thinking this is pushing it to citrus limits. Nothing would have killed them. I doubt we could have killed them until until maybe a mid-feb, week-long cold snap. But it'd be quite easy to strip all the leaves from them by, by leaving them out on a particularly cold night. I didn't quite know what they are, some sort of mandarin, which tend to be quite hardy as they are. But it would have been quite embarrassing to, to have reaped all the rewards and compliments for rescuing these trees over the summer and then killed them by, by pushing them one night too far, by pushing them into early December. So they have now been winched back under glass, there hopefully to, to sit fairly dormant in a cool corner of the greenhouse, away from water and condensation, and watering cans generally. We're going to keep the soil very arid. When I worked at Chiswick House, we kept the citrus. It was a vast citrus collection. I don't know if you've seen the pictures of the wonderful temple, around the, the circular pond. Anyway, it's terraced. It goes down into an amphitheatre shape. And they used to keep beautiful stacks of citrus trees all around there. So there was a, there was a drive to reinstate these at Chiswick. And we had lots of them. And they were stored in pitch black. Pitch black lean-tooth type sheds all over the winter. Not for any particular horticultural reason. I think there was just no space elsewhere. And it's quite interesting to see how they behave. They behaved like the, the plant equivalent of a drowning man throwing up one last desperate wave. They send up incredibly tall stems with very big leaves on them, obviously thinking that, that some other tree had grown over the top of them and, and taken their light. And they were putting up one desperate last effort. The dying man's final hurrah. I've got a very heavily ivied back garden. And I've got a, a rambling rose growing across the front of, of some of this ivy that goes all across the, the back wall of the garden. And somehow some of this rambling rose, it's, it's Malvern Hills, managed to grow into the ivy and then went up desperately trying to find the light through the ivy. And I just pulled it out last week to try and tie, tie the plant in. And it grown like this vast white worm without any sun. The plant had carried on pumping energy into it rather than just giving it up, which is what I think I would have done were I a rambling rose. But it had kept thrusting, thrusting up, no leaves, just this great, big, tapewormy, wormy thing questing around. So I pulled that all out, pulled it out of the ivy like I was, was fishing spaghetti out of a out of a cave and tied it out in the sunshine and it started sprouting leaves at the end of this great expanse of white it's gone ping see i knew this was a good tactic and you would find the light eventually it's amazing what plants will do anyway nothing so exciting will happen to those citrus sitting in the greenhouse they will just stay there until until spring when they can be wheeled out once more to, to bathe in the glory of the the english sunshine and that was it, the end of another thrilling and very exciting week in the garden. There's still so much going on. Hopefully you will hear about some of that next week. Though there might be a slight pause. I'll tell you more about that on our next week's episode. Until then, let's see if I have any recommendations this week.
no recommendations this week, instead a small reading. I received an email, a very nice email, thank you very much for that. If you would like to email me, I can be reached at thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com. I received a very nice email from someone asking if I had any more of the plant essays, the little 500 word projects about plants that I was reading a while ago. And why, yes, I do. I have lots. The problem is that I stopped doing them and then I couldn't remember which ones I had read and which ones I hadn't. And I didn't really want to go through the back catalogue and listen to all my old episodes again to find out. So I sort of stopped doing them. But now I have, with, with some help, I think, found some that I haven't read out yet. So this is 500 words of, of history and advice about the summer fruiting of raspberry. William Pickles Hartley was a 19th century jam baron. I make no air quotes as Hartley wears no apostrophes. He was introduced to God, Lancashire and raspberries as a pickle and a pickle he died. His fortune was in part amassed in the juice fields of Perthshire, where cold winters and long summer days conspired to grow the perfect raspberry. But summer raspberries are a fruit of glut. The canes all produce at once, sometime between June and August, depending on the variety and a grocer does not earn his knighthood from selling punnets of fruit for two weeks in July. So William Pickles Hartley turned to fruit conserve. Jam jar after jam jar after jam jar sent out in earthenware pots until Bill Pickles became Sir William. Personally, I take raspberry jam on toast or swirled into yoghurt, but it tastes of sugar and not of Perthshire or Kent or Kendall or wherever it was grown. For that you need to be present for the magical weeks of raspberry harvest. You need to find a local greengrocer, a man in a green apron who should worry, he should look concerned, he should be nervous because his stock is so ripe that it will be rotten by five, but instead who is serene because he knows that fresh raspberries would sell out in the middle of a house fire. That's your man, and those, those are your fruit. In June of this year, a friend from Colombia stayed with us, and Colombia is a land of fruit. I still have dreams of Guanabana and Lulo and the other things that we ate when we were there. But the grass is always greener and our friend obsesses over cherries. In Whitstable, where we had oysters for breakfast, they were selling punnets of ripe Kentish raspberries. And after eating each one, our friend kissed a napkin until it became a gloopy rag that you might have seen in a in a 19th century melodrama before a tragic death. It turns out she was spitting the seeds into the paper and was intent on smuggling them back to grow on land outside Bogota. I'm not sure how summer raspberries will grow on the equator. Bogota is often as wet and grey as a second Scotland. It does sit on a mountain plateau, but it never gets truly cold and its days are tropically short. Perhaps the project is doomed, perhaps it is not. For those of us who don't live on the equator and wish to grow summer raspberries in a place that actually has a summer, we should be aware that they fruit on old wood. Spent canes should be chopped out each year, the oldest and most gnarled of them, and the fresh canes tied in. If treated as autumn flowering raspberries and cut right back to the ground, then the crop will be leaves, entirely leaves, which are not of much use to anyone, except experimental teenagers who might like to know they can be chopped and dried and used to make a horrible burning hedgerow flavoured throat scalding sort of tobacco. Awful stuff. And also to heavily pregnant women who feel they, they might want to get a move on. A little bit of hedge withery 
from from folkloric past says that the leaves are useful in in these matters as with oysters and jam please consume with caution so there you go a little a little essay telling you how to grow a summer fruiting raspberry that reminds me that i need to cut down the the autumn fruiting raspberries that we grow in the garden at some point summer fruiting raspberries are a brilliant crop they are they are the king of the soft fruit as as i tried to make clear in the essay but you can't beat the longevity of the autumn fruiting raspberry i had one just about two or three weeks ago in november it wasn't particularly tasty. It had lost the ability to, to bind its little little droplets together, the little bits that constitute the fruit. So you could squeeze it and it almost popped, blew up into tiny little very dry balls. But still, I ate it probably five and a half months after I ate the first of its, of its brethren. But enough of that. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that you have a wonderful week. I think things are going to get slightly warmer in England. We've had some wet. We've had some lovely cold, some some beautiful misty, frosty mornings. And now I think we're we're set for that mid-December mild 13 degrees drizzly fog that for me characterizes Christmas weather. Everyone's put on a, a very exciting Christmas outfit. A, a big woolly jumper in, in nylon or their best three-piece tweed suit. And actually, you should be wearing a T-shirt as you as you puff around the fields and lanes. Though I suppose there is still time for, for another change in the weather and one of those elusive white Christmases. I will be talking to you again, hopefully, fairly soon. But until then, thank you very much and goodbye. Mm-hmm.